then let's start with the topic for today. And as already mentioned, the topic is, and hopefully I will give now a good presentation on how to give good presentations and effective presentations. So uh, some organization matters at the beginning, as usual, you can have a copy of the slides. I think this time I even have a QR code at the end where you, that you can scan and where you can download the slides. This is also something if you give a presentation somewhere at the conference that of course helps people. Um, if, you, if you really want to share the slides, of course you will also here, you will also find them in our Moodle course. I might, I, I try a recording and it might work, might not. Um, I had some issues with my microphone last time you noticed, and this time, but this time I have a student uh, in Zoom who is checking and listening all the time. So he will, he will make me aware of if my microphone fails. And if you have questions in between, um, as at the beginning, feel free to ask these questions if you like. So. If you don't want to raise your arm and uh, don't want to ask this question publicly, I've this time also prepared some anonymous question board. This is also a nice way um, to collect questions from the audience. And you know the saying uh, on the internet, no one knows you are a dog. So from my point of view, especially in lectures and if you give presentations with some educational background, it's always a good idea to offer the option to ask questions anonymously. Mm. Also on online lectures and so on, because yeah, I mean, you know the saying, there are no stupid questions, but sometimes people have the impression that their question could be stupid and no one wants to ask a stupid question. So um, at least not with the name attached to it. So this is always a nice way to um, catch questions of the audience. And so you should come to a website that looks like this. And I can maybe reload to check if something happened here. And there's always stupid news on this website. But there, there, there are no questions so far. I will check, hopefully remember to check from time to time if uh, we have questions here. OK, excellent. So then. The first question is, of course, why, why do you want to give a talk or why do you need to give a presentation? Um, if you're working as a lecturer, you might give seminars at universities or schools, high schools, something like this. Then if you are a student, sometimes you need to apply for a stipend or for a grant also as a researcher. And if you are later on working as a researcher, then you will very often have to present your work at conferences, at meetings of your company, something like this, to share your knowledge, to share your insight into some topic and to discuss uh, recent experiences and advances. Maybe one of the most interesting presentations um, and impressive presentations that I have ever given was a science slam. You know what a science slam is? Have you heard of a science slam before? Not really. So a science slam is you usually have 10 minutes uh, to, pre to present your field of research or your recent research topic in, in, an, um, in an understanding and in also some kind of funny um, and entertaining way, let's say. And so I have given a science slam presentation with some other researchers in a large theater. I think uh, th this was in Leipzig, about 600 people in the room. Uh, it's, you, can, you can barely see it on the photograph, but they all doing this, um, I have always difficulty to lose, this Vulcano salute, because uh, Leonard Nimoy died a couple of days ago before this presentation and to honor him, we, we all did this. And I think there was also a presentation related to uh, to Star Trek. And it was very funny because there was, there was, I think some older lady in the, in the audience who really laughed all the time and who would cheer the other audience up. So it was a very, very funny and very, very good and interesting presentation. Okay. So the first question for you is how many presentations have you seen and have you given? 
So if you scan this QR code, you should um, you should get to some website. And for for our now two Zoom attendees, I can try. I don't know. It's just one. Uh, I can try to copy this and put it into the chat. because I know it's easier to access it like this. And there are still some cell phones pointing at me. So I will show the QR code some more seconds and then maybe switch over to my browser, which is here. And then this should be here and now I click on present and um yeah and this the scale of this of the survey is from very few whatever this means to really a lot <laughs> whatever this means I think it's now displaying here some numbers uh, but I think you 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 don't see the numbers. I think the scale goes just from zero to hundred. Uh, so this number here does not necessarily mean that uh, people have seen thirty seven point five presentations. But okay, there's a large spread from only a few to really really a lot. Uh, but there is. As usual, this huge difference between how many presentations you have seen and how many presentations you have given. Um, and I mean, this is also quite natural. You, 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 um, if usually more than one person listens to a presentation, there will be always more presentations that you listen to than you, that you give yourself. And how many of them have been effective presentations? Yeah, I would say, okay, this is what we can could assume to be percent. So it's, just maybe a fifth of them, something like this. Okay, so we can, um, we can, uh, thanks for this, we can discuss reasons for ineffective presentations in a second. So then my typical disclaimer at the beginning, I'm not, um, I'm not a trainer for good presentations. I'm also just an engineer, but I have listened to lots of presentations. I've also already given lots of presentations in my life. So. I've just maybe learned from this experience a little bit um, and, and try to share this experience. So then we can come already to the next survey. And uh, as, as in my, my talk two weeks ago, three weeks ago, um, where we discussed how to draw a good diagram, I also used this upside down method on hey, let's talk about what makes a bad diagram. And so then discuss the reason why it's bad and then how to make it better. And so th this is, I think, always a quite good way to start a topic. So we can do the same here and uh, try to briefly discuss what makes a bad and ineffective presentation. And as there are no um, phones looking at me at the moment right now, I will once again switch over to my browser. Um, try to disable the full screen mode here and open the other tab and go to present. And there are already some ideas discussed. First one is language barrier. This is for sure a huge problem and something that, that I can totally relate to because English is also not my mother tongue, and I've learned English maybe starting from the fifth class in school. And it's for me, it's of course also much, much, much easier to give a presentation in German than in English. And it might be the very same, will be the very same for you. And if you go to a conference um, where there are some Americans or people from the UK speaking English, of course, they have a big advantage over other presenters and and to be honest american people also usually give even if they give a presentation in a different language they usually give very good presentations um so now the, the this language barrier is is hidden into lots of other stuff that i will discuss in a second 
so one, one, one hint that I can give to this language barrier, uh, if you go to a conference, when I went to my very first conference as a young researcher, I remember that my supervisor told me at this time, because we also discussed about the presentation and so on that I had, that I had to deliver there, he said, Matthias, don't be afraid. The conference language is not English, it's bad English. Because for almost everyone else attending the conference, English is also not their, uh, their, their main language, not their mother tongue. And yeah, this, this is, this is, there is really some, um, this is really true a little bit. Okay, so now, um, as you have entered lots of different words, uh, there is no, nothing really pointing out, but language, we have a language the second time. Low self-confidence, this is something that you can work on. Quality of images, this is what we have discussed, let's say two, three weeks ago. Yeah, if you have if you have too many slides prepared, this is also something that can um, can make a bad presentation because then you skip and then you hurry and you run out of time. Um, low confidence, we have once again lack of confidence. Yeah, so even if you talk to very experienced musicians um, or artists, they, they also might have some kind of stage fear and, and um, say it's, it's perfectly natural is something that you, that, you need to, that you need to work with. Okay, so thanks for this um, <laughs> invisible picture. Okay, and, and irrelevant content. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. So... What I'm trying to talk about today is, after the short motivation, how to reach your audience, then you usually prepare something for a talk, a presentation. So how to structure this presentation, then in most cases, especially if you talk about some technical content and scientific content, you, you, you will, in most cases, prepare some slides. So how to design these slides. Um, maybe sometimes you, you do not even need slides. I've also seen excellent presentations, also science slams, where people explain something without the help of slides. So sometimes, um, in, 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 in some cases, I think slides are not the solution. Slides are part of the problem. So sometimes it would be better to, to uh, talk without any slides at all. Uh, then to how visualize data, this is some short recap on, on, and reminder of what we talked a little bit uh, three weeks ago. And because this is quite common, at least since the COVID pandemic, and it will be, I think, also quite common in the future to give online talks, to have interviews online, maybe for job positions, something like this. Um, I will also briefly dive into this topic on what you should take care of when giving an online talk and what to look for in your audio and video quality. Uh, what, what, I should, <laughs> what I try to take care of every week here uh, if I do these recordings or uh, live streaming lectures. Okay, so how to reach your audience. So the first principle is, of course, you should know your audience. This is sometimes easier said than done. Of course, if you go to some scientific conference, you can assume there will be lots of other researchers and scientists. Um, if, you, if you go to a school and deliver a presentation there, you can assume, okay, there will be lots of pupils. But sometimes if you go like to a science slam um, or if you go and, and do some science communication, you know 
what audience will there be and how educated will the people be how what what is their basic knowledge about the topic and so on so but of course you don't want to explain them you don't want to like them uh, like to explain them things they already know and you you don't want to try to explain them things that they will never understand so this is always a little bit the challenge um, you need to know your audience to think about what you can cover in your talk. Then you usually have limited time, so you need to concentrate on the important things. Um, what helps to make um, a presentation more engaging and let's say less boring is try to try to tell at least try to tell a story, try to put it into some storyline. And uh, because there's this famous quote of Oscar Wilde, uh, everyone else role is already taken, try to be yourself. Sometimes it helps a little bit to play a role, but um, you should still feel well with this. And what helps you is try to visualize complicated things. Um, sometimes try to use humor a little bit, try to motivate your audience and do short recap summaries in between. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, once again, easier said than done, try to keep on time. Um, and for, for this, it helps if you, I, I usually also prepare too much stuff. So um, if you prepare a slide set, if you prepare a talk and test it in advance to check to time it, um, and you notice, okay, I've prepared too many slides, then take the slides that you need the least and put it to the end, put it after the, the conclusion slide. So you have them as a backup. And if there's a question related to this, you can always pull out the slide, let's say, but then you don't cover it in your main presentation, but then you have not prepared it for the garbage bin, let's say. So then most important thing from my point of view is speak without notes, try to speak freely, um, try to look at your audience and so on. Um, th there's maybe just one exception for this if you are giving a talk about some very, very specific technical mathematical content. And it's really important that you have all the formulas and all the numbers um, and let's say all the data correctly, then it's maybe okay to have some notes about the main formulas and the, the, the main data points, let's say. But typically, I would strongly encourage you to speak without notes. And if you, if you have this language barrier, then maybe just put the important words and phrases. Sometimes they are very difficult technical terms. Um, put them on your notes, but don't write full sentences there because then you will read these full sentences and it will be really, really boring for the audience. And the, the thing is, if you write a speech, if you, if you write something, um, you, you write it in a different way than you would explain it orally. So if you write something down, you use more and more complicated sentences and it will be more challenging for your audience to understand it. Okay, so then some other ways to annoy your audience. If you speak too quiet, if it's really very, very difficult to hear from the backside of the room, yeah, so then it's really challenging. Um, it, it's, it can be also really challenging if you speak really, really loud so that really, Everyone in the room, the ears are bleeding after the talk because it's so loud. Yeah, then it's it's also challenging. I used to speak um, a little too fast. I know. I also know other colleagues if they are really, um, if they have this stage fear or stage fever, then they talk really, really, really slow and they make long pauses between the words. So then it. Can be also a challenge to listen to this, and um, yeah. So this, this, um, I'm, I, I, I would have to bring a potato to put in my mouth. If you speak all the time, a little, if you, if you mumble, it's difficult to understand. Yeah, so try to speak as clear as possible. Sometimes it's challenging. I know. Okay, so um, then another way to annoy your audience if you are looking all the time on the projection screen rather than to the audience. So of course you should know a little bit what is written on your slides so don't that you don't have to look at them all the time. Usually you will also have your computer somewhere so you can look at the screen. 
Um, I don't have a laser pointer right now because if I want to highlight something, I just use my mouse because the laser pointer would not be visible on the recording. Uh, but if you if you do just, let's say, an on-site live presentation, you will have these laser pointers. I think maybe I have a laser pointer somewhere. Just to um, just to show, and I so use use this laser pointer wisely um, to to highlight stuff. So now I have a green laser pointer. I can show it on the back side of the wall. Uh, don't don't point it into the audience. Uh, you know the saying from laser safety: don't stare into the laser with your remaining eye, and really use this laser just to highlight stuff. Don't flash it all the time because then it's not highlighting anything anymore. It's just there all the time. And so we, we also had a colleague before he's retired now, and he would usually give very, very hard mathematical presentations with lots of formulas. And he would always say, and now this is the important formula and we would insert this into the other important formula. And now then we end up with this most important formula and this is the ever most important formula all the time. And so we, we, we presented him uh, we presented him one of these laser pointers, you know, that you, you, you enable it and then you have not just one laser beam, but lots of them, lots of these laser beams. So you can say now, and the whole slide would light up. Yeah, and even with this, you can, um, I mean, you have flexible arms. If you, if you want to, um, if you want to shine with the laser pointer on the screen, you don't really need to turn your back to the audience. And so for student presentations, sometimes from time to time, if we have exchange students um, from, from different universities with a double degree program, I would like to take photos of these students to send them to their teachers at their home university. And I remember presentations where students have given a 15 minute presentation. And during the 15 minute presentation, they were standing like this all the time. I was not able to take one photograph, not, not just from their back, because all the 15 minutes they would stand like this. And don't, don't do this. Look, look to the audience. Okay. Um, and then don't seem to be unprepared. Sometimes you are unprepared. At least don't leave the impression to do so. Try to be appropriately dressed, whatever this means for the occasion, and um, try to use open body language. If you if you stand like this all the time and delivering a talk like this, it will also look look kind of strange. Yeah, because it looks like you don't really want to talk about your topic. Okay. Oops. So then if you know someone in the audience, because with this problem, some, some people speak very quiet and it's maybe challenging in the room. So if you know someone in the audience, give them a paper sheet like this, let them sit in the last row. And if they think it's too, um, it's not loud enough, then they should raise this and you can see it and you know you have to speak up a little bit or you have to speak a little louder. Okay, so then, Next question, and let me let me check in between if we have some um, questions in this board here, but I don't think so yet. But are there are there are there questions in between? This not does not seem to be the case. Okay, so then how to structure your presentation and think of your presentation a little bit like a journey. You want to go on vacation or you want to go from somewhere to somewhere. So where do you start? Where do you want to end? And what is a good way in between without too many detours? And so, sometimes, I mean, you know, if you go on vacation, sometimes the direct path is also not the nicest path because you go on the highway, you go on the autobahn, you don't see anything. Sometimes it's nice to take the smaller road to also visit some sites. So think a little bit like this for your presentation. But there should be a clear start, there should be a clear goal, and you need to define some way in between. And for some engineering talks, for some scientific talks, there is usually a structure like this. 
you you give some introduction, some motivation into the topic. You try to explain the the main important fundamentals that your audience needs to know and needs to uh, needs to understand to be able to understand your topic and your talk. And then you might have done some experience, some simulations. You will um, discuss and analyze and compare the results. And at the end, there will be some conclusion. And so this structure would fit to 99% of all the engineering talks. Um, so it's a good structure, but it's if you show this, it's maybe a bit too generic because it's the structure of each and every talk. So try to be a bit more precise in this case and say, okay, you, I would, you would like to give an introduction, for example, into the topic of electromagnetic compatibility. And then you will talk about fundamentals of some test environment there. So th this would be a talk of mine. Yeah. Uh, so to talk about reverberation chambers, this is what I deal with in research. And then um, some measurements with shielded cables, some simulations, calculations with MATLAB, and you compare results for coupled voltage or shielding efficiency, something like this. So you see, it's the same structure, but it's not so generic anymore. Then if you, if you plan, how many slides you need to have or you should put in your presentation. Um, if you put lots of content on a slide, then something like two minutes per slide is, um, is a good rule of thumb. If you put not so much content on a slide, sometimes just a picture, just the main statement, then maybe something like one minute per slide is okay. But then you see, okay, in a, in a very short, like, two minute, also in your five minute presentation, it's only more or less something like some advertisement that you can do for your topic. And in a, in a 20 minute presentation, 15, 20 minute presentation, which is the usual duration, if you go to a scientific conference and give a talk there, you can already give some information, but you cannot give this deep insight into a topic. For this, you need much longer, so something like a lecture uh, duration, let's say. So, um, in this two-minute presentation, it's it's maybe a little bit like a pitch, like some elevator pitch. And you just have a very limited time and you, you try to make someone aware of your topic. And even if this 15 in this 15-minute, 20-minute um, conference presentations, of course, you cannot explain your whole research topic uh, from the beginning to the end and everything that you have done. You can just once again, also make some kind of advertisement for the paper and make people, other scientists, aware of your work and, and um, make, make them so interested and curious about your topic that they really will read your paper or your, your longer report and get this um, deeper insight. And the same is, to be honest, for a master uh, thesis defense presentation, there you usually have 25 minutes or for a PhD uh, defense presentation in Magdeburg you usually have 30 minutes and in the 30 minutes of course you cannot explain what you have done in half a year or three four years of PhD research um, but you can uh, make people interested in reading your whole thesis okay so then some more don'ts if you have a too detailed structure um, it will be challenging if you also spend too much or let's say too few time on explaining the outline. Sometimes people show the outline and when showing the outline, explaining the outline, they, they almost already give their whole talk. Uh, this also does not make too much sense. But sometimes people, um, especially students, maybe in master thesis presentations or integrated project presentations, they know okay, I just have so limited time to explain my topic and they already hurry at the beginning so much that they just show this overview slide, let's say 10 seconds. And sometimes I take some notes and cannot look at the screen all the time. And then you look down, write something, look up, and then the, the overview is already gone. So if you, have an, if you have a slide explaining the overview, which of course also makes only makes sense if you have a longer presentation, um, show it, explain it for a reasonable time, not, not too long, too, not too short. And don't cover your topic in chronological order. It's not um, also a master thesis and also a PhD thesis and a research report is not like, a, not like a diary where you write, on a Monday in the first week, I did this and this. 
uh, on the Tuesday in the second week, I did this and this. No, no, it's not about what you did in which order. It's about the knowledge that you gained from this procedure. And this should also be the way of presenting it. Um, yeah, and then this is, if you remember this, this journey stuff, if you have no, no well-defined start, if you have no well-defined goal, and if, if, the, if the tour between this is very back and forth and so on, then it's challenging for the audience to follow. Um, I have a nice XKCV comic about this. You can read it. I won't read it. Give me time to drink something. So one of the very old XKCD comics um, about yeah puzzling sequence of slides at presentations. Okay, so then we can come to this point: how to create useful slides. And the the first and foremost and main important rule is the slides for your presentation. They are just a tool. They they are not your presentation. Um, the presentation is what, what you tell, what you explain, what you talk. And the slides are just a tool that should support you. Um, so really, really use them also as a tool and don't, don't use them as the main source of your, of your presentation. The most common mistake that lots of people make is they put too much information on too much text on one slide and it's really interesting always what happens if i show this slide because i, I look at the audience all the time now huh? and so if i talk most people will look to me while i'm talking and if you it's it's really it's always it, it's always uh, it's always the same so if you show a slide like this then all the eyes will go to the slide everyone will read the text and the thing is, even if I would be explaining what is written there now, I don't explain it right now uh, because you're reading. But the, the thing is, you are reading much faster than I could explain. So even if I would be explaining now what EMC is and what aspects are in there, I'm much slower in explaining this than you can read it. So if you show a text with slide like this, people will read the slide and won't listen to you. And they are much faster in reading than you can explain. And so after they finish reading, they say, okay, now I've read anything. I, I, I have understood the slide. I know what this person are talking about. They, they will still not listen to you and they will do something else. Check their WhatsApp messages, whatnot. And so don't put so much text on the slide because people who read text won't listen to you. So th this is, this is uh, what's, what's written here. What will happen? No one will listen to you anymore. So to make it better is don't put full text on the slides. Just use these head words only as a, as a reminder for you what you would like to talk about and what you would like to explain. So if you say, okay, here I would like to tell about uh, electromagnetic compatibility. And so this is the ability of some equipment under test to... Um, satisfactorily function in some certain environment. So this is the immunity aspect. And it should, at the same time, it should not introduce intolerable emissions or, or disturbances into the same environment. This is the emission part or aspect of electromagnetic compatibility. And so this coupling between different devices and two devices could happen via some electric field and magnetic field, and it could happen over cables, and it also could happen over electromagnetic fields. And then we would call it conductive and capacitive and inductive and radiative and so on. Yeah? And how to make it even better is if you put it in a figure like this and say, okay, yeah, we have every one of us is using lots of electric and electronic devices. And um, we expect that they nicely work together without forcing intolerable interference. And so we have this, what I've just explained. Yeah, And you can say, okay, there will be source of disturbances and there will be a victim and there will be different coupling paths between them and usually we want to um, restrict the emissions of this lower the emissions we would like to increase the immunity of this device of the victim and so on 
So a picture tells a thousand words. Um, also use these, these the pictures in your presentation a lot. Then further advice, don't put too much information on one slide. I would usually advise to have one main message on the slide. What, what is the main message that you would tell with the slides? Use these short head words only. There are lots of rules for this. On one slide, you should have six maximum of six head words, and each head word should have a maximum of six words, something like this. Um, there, there are lots of rules like this. Um, but it, I think it depends a little bit on the context. But in general, use plain design, use few colors, try to use these colors wisely. So here in my presentation, I have always green for the good stuff and red for the bad stuff, or the, the good, the bad, the ugly, and, and, and gray for this maybe not so important stuff, um, large font size so that it's nicely readable, and try to use as few as fancy animations and, and elements only. If you, if, you, if you use something there just to make it look nice, remove it. Uh, don't, don't use it. If, it's, if it serves no really informational purpose. Um, yeah, so for example, if you have, yeah, if, it's, if you have shadows somewhere, if you, if you put a box around something, I would say perfectly nice because it, it helps the reader to say, okay, these three head words belong together because there's a box around them. But if the box has a shadow, no one needs the shadow. I've see, I remember, um, and I won't say the name of the university to, don't, to do not insult them, but I remember that I've been at some presentation and there was... Um, a slide template like this one with the logo of the university. And the logo of the university would change the color every 15 seconds or so. <laughs> and I said, why? <laughs> so I was all the time just sitting there and looking at my watch and say, now it will change. <laughs> now it will change. So I, I think no one needs this. Um, if if you if you need a, a color changing logo on your slides to catch the attention of your audience, no, it won't help. Then it's from my point of view a good idea to number the slides. Um, why why it's a good idea to number the slides? There's there's a comment. Yeah, it will use it will help yourself a little bit, of course, to use the time wisely. Um, I prefer to have these mm, latex beamer slides with this mini frames navigation. So here, it, I think it's also very helpful for the audience to check. Okay, we are in this section right now, and I have too many, so many slides to expect, and so this helps me a lot to to check my time. Um, and and slide numbers, of course. Two, I think the main important point and the main advantage and main reason for having slide numbers is if your audience would like to ask questions related to the slides uh, during the presentation or after the presentation, because then the, the audience, someone in the audience can say, I have a question related to slide 27. Can you go back to this slide, please? And the person does not have to say, I have a slide, uh, I have a question related to the slide with this strange picture that I did not understand. Can you go back to this slide? Once again, you remember where there was something like this. Um, so this is mainly the reason for asking questions. It's, it's much easier to ask a, spe a specific question if the slide is numbered. And having a header and footer, I mean, here I have something like the structure, the overview. Um, you, you might want to have the affiliation with the university, something like this. Um, and I always, I also have the title of the presentation here, and I might also have the name here, why it's sometimes meaningful to have the name of the speaker and the title of the presentation on each and every slide. You, you have some idea or you, 
you, you, you could imagine a reason why this is necessary. And, and so here we can also see this is, um, this is the best, the best space here. This is the, um, in Monopoly, this, this is the most expensive road, let's say. Yeah? And then the, the quality of the area goes down because the, the lower the position on the slide, the more difficult it will be for the audience. So if I'm showing something like here, I can see lots of people doing like this because it's it's maybe challenging to see. So here it does not make too much sense to have this title of the talk on each and every slide. Um, but if you go to a conference, to a large conference, there will be many, many sessions and tracks and presentations in parallel. And it might happen that you are watching one presentation in one room and then change to a different session. And because there is some time overlap, um, you, you attend two minutes too late. So if you, you have missed the title slide and still you want to make sure, am I in the right room listening? Am I listening to the right presentation? And so for, for large conferences, it's always good to have your name and the full title of the presentation on the slide for if people come in in the room later, uh, so that they know, okay, this is really the right presentation that I was that I would like to see. Then some more ways to annoy your audience. Of course, if you have typos on your slides, if you have super complicated formulas that no one will really understand in this limited amount of time, if you use inconsistent notation in these formulas, and also unknown abbreviations. If you go to standardization meetings, it's really hell because those people there use lots of abbreviations. And if you don't know them, you cannot follow these presentations. Really a challenge. Then I would uh, not suggest to use a font like this. I mean, here the projector is very good, but these Times New Roman font and similar fonts, they have these small, um, do you know the name of, I will, I will point it in the room. Do you know the name of these Tiny, tiny things here at the tips of the of the letters, near edges. I think in typography they are called serifs. And so the purpose of these serifs um, is to help the, the the human eye to follow a line if you read longer parts of text. So if you open up a good book or if you open up a newspaper they will use this font a lot because you have lots of text and it helps uh, the eye as a, you read one line, you go to the next line, read this line, you go to the next line and so on and so on. Um, but as discussed in the presentation, you don't have that much text. So you don't need this font. And the problem with the serifs is with these tiny edges here um, is that on bad projectors and with a small font and bad resolution, they will be sometimes just one or two or three pixels. So they, they don't look really good. And so it's much better to have a clear font uh, without these serifs, a sans serif font like this Arial, like this one here. Then um, as already discussed, don't use fancy animations, don't use anything that is not really there on purpose and delivering information. And also if you have too many different colors, it can be also confusing. So the uh, last thing to discuss for the slides is there are some kind of, let's say, contradicting tasks of slides. And the only, the only task of a slide set um, as discussed at the beginning of the section is the slides should support your talk. They should support what you are talking about and help you with visualizing complicated uh, things, having a diagram, having a figure, something like this. Um, this is, let's say, the only, the only task of a slide set, the only real task. Sometimes um, people also use slides as a documentation of the talk. They said, hey, I could not attend your presentation, but can you send me the slides, please? And if, if you can understand and comprehend the full talk just out of the slides, then it was a bad talk or it was a bad slide set because then everything was written in the slides. So if you want to uh, 
document the talk, maybe do a recording or prepare a handout, something like this, if it's really necessary. But don't use a slide set as a documentation of a talk. And then sometimes what people do is they use, put lots of text on the slides and use the slides as a manuscript for themselves to read aloud what is written there, like in some karaoke bar. Yeah? And you just need this hopping dot that goes from word to word. And I said, don't use this. Um, then maybe if you really need this, use some small notes um, in, in, in PowerPoint. Um, and even with PDF slides, you could do something, you could, you could use a second screen, like your computer screen, where you have some notes and you can maybe sometimes look there. But if you, once again, if you look down um, all the time, I now do it on purpose and just look at the screen all the time without looking at the audience, it's not really nice and not really pleasant for you. Okay, so how to visualize data? I think this is uh, something that I can go over very quickly. We discussed this example of a really bad diagram. Um, once again, font is very small. The units are missing. Why do we have this gray background? Because it's just a screenshot out of MATLAB. Um, if I zoom in, you can see the quality is very bad because it's this raster graphic and it's also compressed in this lossy JPEG compression, creating all these nasty artifacts around um, sharp edges. So a much better way, and we all also discussed here this XKCD comic with the, with the missing units. Um, I will skip over this. So this is still not better with frequency and current uh, added there because the, the units are, for example, still missing. So the, the same sample improved would look like this. So now we have access labels, we have clear units, we have a thicker line, we have a larger font that is nicely visible. And if I zoom in, we can see, okay, it's also one of these vector graphics that nicely scales uh, without compromises in quality. And we also discussed this Raster graphic versus vector graphic stuff. Raster graphic consists of single pixels. For every pixel, it's stored what is the grayscale or what are the colors. Problem is, if you increase the figure, if you rescale the figure, um, you will see these single pixels. So for figures like this, for plots, for charts, for diagrams, um, for, for line art figures, let's say, it's much more advantageous to have these vector graphics that consists of these single geometric elements. And here, even if the small one, I can zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and it will always look good. I mean, this is the advantage of this vector graphics. And some more ways to annoy your audience. Tables are always a challenge in presentations. So sometimes you need to show tables, but tables can be very puzzling and very confusing for the audience because you have lots of numbers and you, you need to, some time to understand, okay, what are the rows and columns in this table? Um, so if you need to show tables, you really need to guide your audience a little bit through this table and then maybe highlight. So you, you, you have lots of numbers, but at the end, you, you, you just want to show maybe one or two, which are important because with these parameters, yeah, in this row and this column, you get, the, the maximum output or you get the most efficient whatever. Um, so put a small, I don't know, rectangle around this number or make it, make it bold, something like this to highlight, okay, these are, I'm showing you lots of numbers, but these two numbers or this one number, this is really, really the important one out of this table. Then don't, except for you do it on purpose, don't show this, use this raw computer output because it's also really difficult to understand. And um, don't copy plots directly from your paper as we discussed three weeks ago, because then the font, the font size, it, it was nice for your paper, but for the presentation, it will be just too small. So it's, it's always a good idea to redo uh, in MATLAB or in LaTeX or what, where, wherever <clears throat> to redo the presentation for, uh, to redo the figure for the presentation with, with the better font. And if you use figures from someone else, give credit to the source and mention 
um, the reference for this figures that have been created by third parties. Okay, so then I will shortly check, but there are no questions here. Um, are there, are there, what, what questions do we have so far in the room? Always gives me time to drink something. Oh, there's a question. Yes. Um, I don't have a table in the presentation, but I mean, format a table, like really with a table with uh, horizontal lines and vertical lines and use, try to use short and clear labels for the columns and lines in your table. And then even you, if I mean, uh, the table, even if you have, let's say, just three columns and, and four rows or five rows, you will have 15 entries, 15 elements in the table. And it's, as I said, it's really challenging for the audience to understand. Uh, maybe let me go back one slide. Yeah, to understand, like in this example here. So we have, um, we have rows, we have columns. What is the meaning of the rows? What is the meaning of the columns? What, what is the meaning of these numbers here? And what is the most important number? Or what is, what is the message that you're trying to tell with this table? And I don't recall what from which presentation I have copied this or what would be the main message of the slide here. Um, I, I don't know, but but what, what, what I would do to make this table a little nicer and a little more pleasant is as set to, um, to insert lines like this. Uh, to, to insert at least one line here and, and one line here somewhere. I don't know. But you see, in this table, it does not really fit because the numbers are somehow overlapping. And it's even more challenging and confusing to, to understand and follow this. But you, you get the point. OK, more questions? This not seems to be the case. So we can come to the last section and shortly talk about online talks and maybe recordings like this, live streams, Zoom interviews, WebEx presentations, Skype stuff, uh, big blue button, I don't know what is Microsoft Teams, all, all, all these systems there. So first and most important thing is take care of good audio quality. You, you can have the nicest presentation. Uh, you can have the most beautiful looking camera picture in the world. If, if you are difficult to understand, then it will be really, really challenging to follow your presentation. So once again, it's the same with like the slides and your, your talk. What is important is your talk. The slides are just a tool. And so also an online presentation, your screen sharing, your slides there, they're also just a talk. Uh, they're also just a tool. If people cannot understand what you are talking about, it will be really, really challenging to follow. And um, yeah, so, so please take care of good audio quality. There are different microphones that you could use. And of course, in the room, you won't know the difference right now because you are not hearing me over the microphone. Um, but I can, I can switch over to the internal microphone of my computer, which is this one here right now. So now I'm speaking into the microphone of my computer. It's a very expensive computer. It has been a very expensive computer a couple of years ago. So I think they have a they have built in a very good microphone or many microphones inside there that do some algorithm to, uh, to give a quite reasonable quality. So you can listen to this in the recording. So, okay, this was the internal microphone. Um, next thing, or this is still the internal microphone. Next thing that you could use is the microphone integrated in the webcams. And I'm, I have a camera in front of me and I will now switch over to the microphone of this camera which is this one right now. So I think this might also be okay. The, the, the problem with all these microphones is that 
they, they are quite in the distance from my mouth. So they are not capturing only my voice directly. They will also catch lots of reverb and echo from the room. Same as you with the camera. Um, and so quality there also can be a challenge, especially in larger rooms and where the walls are very flat and where you have lots of to be honest, I think also most of these lecture rooms are not very good in terms of audio. Uh, we we would, have, would need to have more corrugated walls. And um, sometimes in the newer buildings, you see at the ceiling that there are plates with lots of holes in there, or also sometimes on the backside. And they are, they are there on purpose to remove reverb, to remove echo from the room. OK, so. Um, of course, the best mic microphone is the microphone that you have, but I cannot, I can usually not suggest to use the internal microphones and webcam microphones. Internal microphones from the computer also sometimes catch, capture noise from the, from some fan or from the hard drive or something like this. So what is better is a headset. I don't have a headset here today to check, but what I'm using today is some lapel mic. Uh, some Lavalier microphone mods, which is attached to my polo shirt here. That's why I'm always wearing polo shirts. <laughs> so I can switch back to this microphone, which should be this one here right now. And yeah, so these microphones uh, in most cases should give you a quite good quality um, and more or less directly capturing it from where you speak with maybe some reverb and echo from the room, which makes it sound more natural. Um, and sometimes if you use these headsets, it, it sometimes sounds a little artificial because you, you don't have any, um, you, you lose the context sometimes of the room. And if you place them too close to your mouth and to your nose, sometimes you have this breathing noise that if you breath in and out that you also hear this in the microphone. So I can suggest to use something like this. And so the one that I am using to, to move around, uh, to be able to move around in the room, and I can move around in the room. Um, so this is a wireless microphone. And because it's wireless, it makes it rather costly. So this one is, I don't know, 200, 250 euros, something like this, because it's also a two channel uh, microphone, I have a second microphone somewhere here in the in the charging box that I could also hand to someone in the audience um, to ask a question. But if you buy these microphones wired with a cable, like a two meter cable, which would be also enough to give something like a lecture here, um, then they are just let's say you can get very good models for something like 30, 40 euros on, 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 on the internet, of course. Okay, and yeah, so poor audio quality, I always compare it a little bit with like bad, oops, bad breath in, in on-site meetings. Yeah, it's, it's no problem for the person. So if you are the one that has a bad audio quality, you will not, not notice it. You won't care. It's, it's only a challenge for the others and a problem for the others. And it's a little bit like bad breath. Yeah, it's, it's no problem for you. It's just a little bit annoying for everyone else in the room. And um, it, depending on your position and the position of the others, people will tell you about the issue with your bad microphone or they won't. Yeah, but a good audio and video quality in an online talk is a little bit like that you have a nice haircut and then you, that you wear a proper dress in some on-site meeting. So this is what, what yeah. And, and so if you, if you would have, if you would go to some on-site interview, you would also, I don't know, buy a dress, get a suit, something like this, um, and spend some money on this. So if you do an online talk, from my point of view, you should also spend some money, not on a suit, not on a dress, but on buying a proper microphone and a, um, and a proper camera. Okay, so uh, enough talking about audio quality. Next thing, let's talk about video quality. And so for video, 
a good light will beat a good camera. You can have the best camera in the world. If you have bad lighting, you will have a bad picture. And I can also try to explain it a little bit here. Uh, for this, I will stop sharing my screen uh, to make my camera window a little larger. And so I'm, I'm, I, can, I can zoom out a little bit. So I'm in this nice seminar room here. And um, I have this white neutral background, which is quite good. And if I turn on my camera, lost tracking once again, if I turn into this direction, you can see that I have lowered the window blinds here on purpose, uh, because if I, if I lift them up and go back to my go back to my original setting you would see now uh, camera is, or it's still the same camera and i mean it's also a 200 something euro camera uh, because of this tracking but picture now just looks bad because i'm very bright from this side and it's very dark from this side and it's it's looking much more pleasant if i lower this once again and just have this uh, well, light coming from this direction where you sit. Um, it's maybe a little dark now, I'm, I'm, yeah, but it's still much better than what we had before. And the same thing happens if you if you stand in front of a, la, uh, um, a bright background, like the projector. If you stand in front of the projection screen, you will also not have this nice picture. Um, just looking, looking dead. So video quality um, strongly depends. Let me share my screen once again from the lighting. So I would always suggest not sit in front of a window because then you will have this bright background and you will yourself will be very dark. Um, I can also try to do this. Yeah. So if you have your laptop on a, on the table and just use the internet camera, maybe I can switch over to my internet camera, which should be this one here. Um, and maybe uh, also stop sharing the screen for a second. Yeah, it's the same view. Yeah. So it's the always it's the the double chin and is my is my nose clean shot. Um. It's somehow okay, but it's also not really uh, looking really good. So I will switch over to my other camera here once again. And so this camera, uh, I always place between me and the audience and try to check that I have a nice neutral background. Okay, share my slides once again. This is the, this figure here is the problem that we have just seen light from the side, the other light is very um, dark. So then this is with light from the top. It's usually okay. I mean, in TV studios, they have a headlight uh, because it looks, it looks good if you have hair. If you don't, it does not look that good. And so this is, uh, this is a picture where I'm sitting exactly the opposite like this. So I'm looking to the window I'm having the, the light from the window um, shining on my face. And I think this is the most pleasant picture here. And so the, the, the natural source of light is always a good source of light, but don't use a window pointing to the sun because then you have this direct light. You want to have a window, let's say to the north or something like this where you have indirect light, diffuse light, um, and don't have this hard light and shadow. And this is also somehow, so this is the new setup in my office. Um, and this was the old setup in my office. And uh, so here I had light from the window on this side. And on this side, I had a very powerful 500 watt uh, halogen lamp that with a dimmer that I could dim a little bit depending on the, on the strength of the sun to always have the same amount of light on this side of the face and the other. But you can see it's still, it's it's usually not a not a good idea to mix these different sources of light because this um, halogen lamp has a very 
warm color and the sun has a very um, cold color of light. And it's not good to mix them like this. Okay, uh, so this should be enough for online presentation. So in summary, I can encourage you uh, to practice, practice, practice presentations a little bit. To of course also know your equipment. Um, if you have a camera mic, or even if you just have your computer, you should know, okay, how to connect HDMI, how to, um, how to copy the screen to the projector, something like this. And I know some professors, even at our faculty, who have huge problems in going somewhere and connecting their computer to the presentation equipment. And from my point of view, if, if, you, if you study electric engineering and if you are not able to connect your computer to some projector, you should use your PhD title. Um, and once again, easier said than done, don't, don't be nervous or at least don't leave the impression to be nervous. And of course, what you can also do is you can learn from other good presentations. And one, from my point of view, and many other persons agree, one very excellent presentation that is always also given as an example for a good presentation is when Steve Jobs introduced the first iPhone in uh, 2007. Um, and yeah, you can, you can watch a recording like this on YouTube. It's a very nice presentation. And you also, he, he uses lots of these aspects that I've just explained in the slides. Okay, so here you can download the slides. Thanks for your attention. And uh, we still have, I don't know, five more minutes to discuss some questions.